Hey, it's your open source advocate and today I'm going to talk about building a home lab. Now if you've been watching my channel for a while you've probably already got something set up. Maybe you're using my videos to help build your business on open source. Maybe you're using the videos to help you build out your ultimate home lab. Maybe you're just getting started and you've just found my channel. And if that's the case then welcome. I just want to help you understand what it takes to get started doing some home lab work. Um, there's a lot of really easy ways to get into it, pre-built machines, things like that. But this channel here is all about using open source software and kind of getting into it and building it out yourself and feeling that sense of satisfaction that you've done something really awesome and that you've got something that you control that's much more private than hosted services that really just lets you take that on and keep it in your own infrastructure in your home. So it's called a home lab for that reason. And we're going to talk about how you can build that out and what you might need to get started. Maybe some of you have been watching my videos for a while and you're trying to figure out how all this works and how to put it together. I'm not going to go that deep into that, but I will have links in the, in the description that will point you to other videos that I've done that can help you put those things together. I also have links to different things that I talk about here so that you can kind of see what you need to get started. I want to say thank you to all of my subscribers and all of my patrons over at Patreon. Seriously, you guys make this so worth it for me to do these videos every week. I really, truly enjoy it. And I just can't say thank you enough. If you're enjoying these videos, subscribe. Let YouTube know that I'm doing a good job by subscribing to the channel. Plus, you'll get notified when I have new videos coming out. And finally, if you're enjoying what I'm doing, give it a like. Just click on that thumbs up. And that way YouTube knows that you like it. And they'll pass it along to other people that might enjoy my content as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Let's get started. So the first thing I want to talk about is actually when you start your home lab, you want to think about what kind of hardware do you have that you can use to start building out your home lab. And really, you don't have to have anything special. You don't need a server. You don't need something giant and massive with tons of power. You don't need even a desktop PC. You could use an old laptop that you might have laying around or maybe a Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi is one of the least expensive ways to get started in home lab. Now, finding these since the pandemic has been a little bit tricky. It's a little hard because the production slowed down so much, but there should be some out there. I wouldn't pay for a Raspberry Pi 3. I wouldn't pay more than $25 for a Raspberry Pi 4. With 8 gigs of RAM, I would not pay more than $75 for, for 2 gigs of RAM, $45 for 4 gigs of RAM, $65. So kind of take that with, with what you're, you're looking at for different options, but um, you can find them. They're out there now. Raspberry Pi is not the only single board computer available. There is also Orange Pi and Banana Pi and all the other ones that took some other fruit and decided to call it something different that are built on the same types of architecture. Sometimes their chips are a little better. Sometimes they have a little better graphics. Sometimes they have different ports and things like that. But as long as you can get started with something that you want to run, that's the most important thing about what hardware you use. So Raspberry Pi uses the ARM chipset. Most of the other ones, Orange Pi, Banana Pi, all those, they use the ARM chipset as well. There are some small single board computers that use the Intel chipset. Those might be more interesting to you. Sometimes there's just more stuff available for the x86-64 type architecture. And when I say those words, all that means is the type of chip that it's built on. So ARM is a chip type that has a certain operation set that says, hey, if you just build your application to work on ARM, it should be fine x86-64 is more like your standard laptop desktop type chips that you'll see with Intel and AMD and those can run a different type of operations and a lot of applications are made to run on those first and then later move to ARM but that's starting to swing the other direction so that's really nice because we're getting more ARM options the nice thing about these little boards is while this is big on the screen it's a it's a little bigger than a credit card in reality it is very very small um, very tiny footprint and it uses very little power you can power one of these things off of a 5 volt charger like for your phone in most cases. If it's just got a little bit of current, just enough current, it can run this thing. And I, that's what I do a lot of times. So this is super low power, which means you're not using a ton of power to run the services you want to have in your home. You're not running a giant server that takes up 600 watts of power just to turn on. So if you're not interested in the Raspberry Pi or you can't find one or you can't find a single board computer you like, the next option is an old laptop. If you have an old laptop laying around or if you see one on Facebook or Craigslist and you get somebody who says, I'll show you that it works. Or if you see that somebody has some other option out there, maybe it's an old MacBook or something, anything you can find that turns on and plugs in. And it, uh, ideally, if the battery works, even for an hour or two, that's really great for when you have power outages because your, your, your home lab doesn't shut down. It just keeps running on that battery until the power comes back if you set up 
everything in your operating system right, which is really awesome. So an old laptop is a really great way to go. And this is really where I kind of started. Um, I had an old laptop that I was able to get from my work, which was awesome. I switched out some hardware just to get rid of the spinning drive and put in an SSD and put in a little bit more RAM. And I ran a lot of my home lab services off of this thing for a long time. And it was really solid. When we'd have a power outage, it would just keep on running until the battery died or until the power came back, which usually the power came back first, which is great. So I really, if you, if you have something like this laying around, this is a really great way to get started. If you want to go a little bit further now, I, yeah, I stock, I used your picture. Sorry about that. Um, if you want to go a little bit further, you can get a desktop. So desktop PCs have been around forever. You can probably find an old desktop for super cheap out there. This does use more power in most cases, so it is a little bit harder to get it started. But same idea as a laptop. You're just going to use old hardware that you've got laying around or old hardware that you can get from somebody pretty cheap and put that to use because these things are great for start starting up a home lab. And as you grow into your home lab and you realize you're outgrowing the, the hardware that you've got, you can move up into better hardware over time. Now, the last option, maybe you have access to some old servers or some older servers that people are retiring at this point. I've got a few old servers that were going into retirement that a company had refurbished and they sold a relatively inexpensively and you can put a ton of hard drives in them, which is really great. So if you're trying to build like a network attached storage system, if you're trying to build out something for a media server, we've got tons of 4K video and stuff like that that's going to use a lot of space. These things are really great options. Now, they use a lot more power in most cases to run, so be aware of that. But, but they're a really great option if you can find one and they've got tremendous stability built into them in 99% of the cases, they're, they're gonna be rock solid. So this is another option for the hardware. After the hardware, you wanna start thinking about a couple of things. So one that I highly recommend you learn is what's called Docker. If you've never heard of Docker, it's a, it's a type of virtual machine, but it's a very special type of virtual machine. It's a very minimalized, virtual machine and, it's, and it uses what they call a container. So virtual machines, if you've ever heard of that, is you run your computer, so that would be down here. You've got your operating system running on it. Maybe it's Windows, maybe it's Mac OS, maybe you run Linux, which is a great head start if you do. Um, and then you install some piece of software on top of that operating system, just like you would install Word or Adobe stuff. You would install a piece of software that then lets you run virtual machines. These virtual machines are just like running this Windows operating system on top of your computer, except they run in a virtual environment. It's not running here, it's running in a special environment that tries to take advantage of some of this stuff, advantage of some of your OS stuff. It uses up a good amount of power and CPU and GPU depending on what you're running, but it's a really cool way to check out other operating systems and maybe get into some home labbing to start off. Uh, virtual machines are all right, but they do use a lot of power. The nice thing about Docker containers is they're a kind of virtual machine. So again, you see you've got that lower level, that hardware, so your laptop or your Raspberry Pi, or maybe your desktop or your server. Then you've got the operating system that runs on it. So just depending on which device you get will depend on what you're running on it. Then you put the Docker engine. So instead of a hypervisor that runs full virtual machines, you get what they call the Docker engine. And Docker is really cool because it's entirely encapsulated bit of software. So the operating system gets pulled down with everything else that's inside of this container. So the applications that you're running are what they call containers in most cases. Now, sometimes an application needs more than one container. It might have a database container and it might have a application container and a web host container and all kinds of other things. But Docker makes it really easy to get this set up once you learn some of the basics of Docker. There's tooling around Docker, like Docker Compose, that you can use to even make it easier and make it very repeatable, which is really nice. So in a VM, you set up the VM, the, the operating system, maybe you run Windows in a VM, you know, Windows 7 for some reason, and you want to put something on that. You can do that, but the next time you try to spin up that same VM, it, it takes a little bit of work to get it exactly like what you had. Whereas with these Docker containers, you can destroy this one and bring up another one exactly like it with a single command. It is just so super easy to get these running. And the reason they call them containers is because Docker is based on the idea of a ship that carries containers. So this is your ship down here. This is your container on the ship and this is your container and this is your container. And just like on a ship where the containers have locks on the doors and they can't talk to each other, these also can't talk to each other unless you give them special permission to do that. So maybe you put a net around these two containers that say, hey, these go together. Or maybe you put a net around these two that say these go together, or maybe it's all three. But you can also just have them be individual things that can't even communicate. So there's a lot of really nice security pieces around this that really help out with it as well. So learning Docker, I highly recommend. 
I've got some videos out there. All my videos, almost all of my videos use Docker, so you could learn it just over time by doing it. I think that's one of the best ways to, to learn it as well. The other thing you really, really want to learn is the most basic parts of networking. So today, most people can go buy a router or a wireless router at Walmart right off the shelf, bring it home, plug it in, connect something to it the first time, and then run through a wizard that helps them set up everything in a very generic way, which is perfectly fine for 99.9% .9 of homes. But if you want to be in a home lab environment, you need to have some basic understanding of what's happening inside of this little device. So you've got this router that says, hey, I see something right here and I want it to be able to connect to me. So you have to be able to know how is this connecting and how is information going back and forth? And then how is information going back and forth from this one? And how does this know how to keep these two guys separate and make sure I don't deliver this guy's request to this guy by accident? So it's really important that you understand some basics of, not, of networking so that you can set some things up in your home lab because home labbing is about setting up new devices on your network, making sure you can connect to them from inside your network, and optionally from outside your network on the internet. So maybe you're out of your home, maybe you're on a vacation, and you're like, man, I've got media at home, why can't I watch it while I'm on vacation? You can, especially if you set up your home lab correctly and you understand what goes on in this network, you can totally do that. And there's all kinds of tooling out there to help you keep everything secure that's inside this network and help you connect securely to your network from outside of it. But you definitely need to understand some of the basics around networking if you want to be able to do this in an intelligent and safe way. That is, that is the most important thing you can do when you're doing a home lab. And the last thing I highly, highly recommend is get comfortable with some command line stuff. So a lot of people think that Linux is this. They think this is Linux. It's not. Linux is a very full featured graphical user interface set of applications, just like Windows, just like Mac OS, just like anything else. But, the power of Linux comes from the command line. You can do everything and more from the command line in Linux. And honestly, running a server that's headless is what they call it. It means that it does not have a graphical user interface like this, where I have this little start menu and I can go pick my applications and I can see everything in a graphical way. It means that really this is how you interact with it right here. Now, there are some really awesome web-based applications for the browser that you can set up on a headless system and then connect to it to control that server through the browser. Really great things out there. I cover several of those on a lot of my videos and there's tons of other videos out there that go through that stuff. But really being comfortable with the command line, learning some of the basic commands for Linux and going through videos with different YouTubers, people like me, people like Christian Lampa, people like just so many different different guys out there that go through this stuff and really show you how to dig in and do things. Learn Linux TV is another really, really great channel that you can go and watch and just learn so many great things about Linux. And he goes into such great detail and shows you what you need to know. It's really awesome. Um, just so many really, really awesome channels out there for you guys to go check out. But if you can start with your hardware, jump over and understand some basics of software and Docker containers and how that works. Understand the basics of networking so you can understand how your network functions and how you can make different things talk on the network and out, even from outside the network. I know that sounds like a lot, but really and truly, this would be the most basic things you need to know about networking. You don't have to know super advanced networking. You don't have to know super advanced skills of all kinds of hacking and stuff like that. This is the most basic skill level that you should have in order to start doing a home lab. And anybody can do it. If you're sitting there going, wow, that sounds like a lot. I don't know if I could do it. You can. You just have to decide, I want to step in today and try to try to figure something out. And you're going to hit bumps. You're going to hit hurdles. You're going to hit roadblocks. You're going to feel frustrated at times. But the best thing about the open source community is there's a huge community. I have a community built around open source that you can go and ask questions and I'll try to help you or some of the other guys that are in my community will try to help you. There are just tons and tons and tons of forums and, and all kinds of places that you can go ask questions about a specific application. They almost always tell you, here's where you can come and ask questions. Here's how you can get more information. Here's how we can help you get this running. So please get out there and try it. I know if you're watching my video and you've made it this far, you are interested. Have faith in yourself because I believe in you and I know that if you want to do this, you can learn it because I've been learning it 
as I go along, all along, I stumble, I fall, I get back up, I try again, I get frustrated, I walk away, I punch the punching bag for a little while, I come back in and try again. And at some point I'm successful and that success feels so incredible that I just can't describe to you what it feels like to do that. But I hope you'll come on this journey with me. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along on the open source journey with us. And I'll talk to you next time. It's your open source advocate and I'm back and I've set up a store with a little bit of merchandise. I love being your open source advocate, but I want you guys to be the open source advocates with me. So if you want to get out there and get some of this stuff. And if you do, let me know what you think of it. Thank you for subscribing.